if you feel like social media is actually contributing to our anxiety or what's your opinion on that? You know, I, I just want to point out that a few people are saying online on Instagram that the sound is out. So I, I definitely want to let people know that they can also uh, watch us via Zoom. If they go to our fa go to a AACPG's Facebook page, they can also get onto the Zoom link. You can just put in that search AACPG. Yeah. There are no others. Are no Click others. on that and it'll take you right to our page. So please yeah. um, do that switch over because we don't want to miss this information. Yeah, so yeah, I, so I apologize to anyone that's on Instagram if the sound is going out. You know, we got to love technology in the era of COVID. So, um, so definitely uh, apologize for that. Um, that's AAC, so I'm sorry, that's AACPG Lake County. But um, please, uh, with the social media and anxiety, and, and is it a relief or is it a contributor? How you do you know, feel about that? I found that Facebook uh, and Instagram it could be a huge trigger to individuals who are struggling with, you know, FOMO, fear of missing out. They're struggling with, you know, looking at others who are probably doing okay in the pandemic, but then they think about their own uh, lives and, and they're comparing, right, the two. Like, I've lost my job. I work in the service industry. I work for this hotel or this um, restaurant and, I'm, I'm not where I used to be a year ago today. So you, you may start to feel um, higher levels of anxiety on social media. And, and that's where you're going to have to learn to just, you know, like disconnect the tube, get, out, get off of social media, take it off your phone. I mean, here, we're on social media, so we want, you, we want people to, to see us, but we also realize you have to protect your mental health. And if there are things and, and sites and, and pictures and reminders that are difficult for you that are very much present on a regular basis on social media, it, you know, come off of it, limit your interactions, right? And we are doing this in the name of protecting our mental health. Nothing is more important than really doing our best to protect our mental health. Sure. And if you're following all the same kind of, if you're following a bunch of things that are involved in say, police brutality, and you're going to get a whole stream and it's going to seem like the whole day you're getting pelted with that kind of information. So I agree. And it, it's really important. It seems like to really pick and choose who you're going to follow, or I've heard of people just going on a diet from it and they just don't deal with it for a little while. Right. And, and you know what, I, I went on a social media diet from Facebook. I just, I had to give myself a break. I had to, you know, step away. Um, I kept Instagram. I felt like Facebook can sometimes be a diary of a lot of people's emotions, unfiltered, very raw. And as a psychologist, feeling like an empath already, that was enough to, you know, going on there on a regular basis, like, ah, uh, I need a break. So I removed that, that diet or that carb, right? I was carb loading. Uh -huh. on Facebook. And so uh, I just stuck with Instagram just to see a couple of photos, press a like, and then move, keep it moving. And that helped bring down my anxiety, right? Psychologists, right. we feel anxious, right? We feel depressed, we feel tired, we feel stressed. It, it's normal, right? It's just when it becomes abnormal or overwhelming and it's disrupting uh, you know, our, our daily living skills is, uh, and our daily ability to just function is when we wanna get that help and resource. Yeah, sorry, people keep saying I'm muted. So I, I again, I apologize. I'm not muted uh, on Instagram, but you know, we got again, uh, we got to love technology. So can you hear me? Did we lose you, Demetrius? Uh, I'm right here. Oh, okay. I was just checking. All right, we're good. Um, sorry about that. So just diving into COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So for COVID-19, just for example, my mom, okay, um, one of our elders, right? Mm -hmm. uh, my mom was very social, exercise groups, church groups. Um, she would watch the kids after school. My kids after school, she would go pick them up and bring them home and they would spend that time with her. And of course, now for about four months, she hasn't seen the kids uh, or she's seen them, but you know, distance but no hugs, no nothing like that. Um, 
and now she doesn't go to her groups anymore. She really just sits at home and she's watching a lot of news. Mm. Um, and then she'll get out and she'll go for a walk every once in a while. But her lifestyle has fully changed. And I know there's a lot of parents out there and grandparents who are in this boat where their whole life has changed. Even if their kids' lives really haven't changed that much, we're just staying home a little bit more, their lives have changed a lot. And just wanted to get your perspective on the, the anxiety that that brings in and the health of our elders and what we should be doing. You know, we're in the sandwich generation and a sandwich generation is when we have individuals younger than us that we care for. And then we're also caring for the of our elderly parents, oh. right? Or grandparents, mm -hmm. right? So we're in that sandwich generation. So we're sandwich watching our parents become more and more increasingly isolated, isolated from their loved ones, their grandchildren, their friends, their social support because of this pandemic. And so then uh, Michelle Obama said it just a week ago, she has low grade depression. And we're finding that a lot of our, our elders are feeling that low grade depression. We're finding that they are uh, fatigued by the pandemic by not the errand that they used to do. Um, and many of them who may live in nursing homes or other assisted living facilities, they have to do air hugs or they have to do fist bumps from a distance. That's not the typical interaction that they were used to. And, and that has an impact on the elderly, right? When you're, when you're happy and you're around and you're social, but now you're confined to your room, for your home, those four walls will start to close in, right? And, and what we do know about our elders is that many of them are not the most socially savvy person on the internet, right? They're not, they don't got a TikTok page, right? They're not doing TikTok videos. They not, they're not dancing. You're not seeing them like going on live on Instagram while they're out on walk and they got their, their phone or whatever talking to people. So, all, what do they have? Well, I'm thinking about my mom, Wheel of Fortune. That's all that she's watching or the news or let's make a deal. Like she just has her game shows. So, right. you know, phone calls, yes, but we have to do our job um, as their children mm -hmm. and their grandchildren. Okay, it looks like Dr. Sanders froze. Um, maybe let's give her a minute to, she'll probably try and come back. Yeah. Guys, I really apologize for all these technical difficulties. Uh, technology doesn't want to let us be great tonight. So um, with that being said, you know, uh, I just wanted to also share an interesting story with the elders and, and I left and we came back from a little trip. We went camping and pulled up to my house and I have one son that's nine and one that's uh, 13. We pulled up to my mom's house in the driveway because we we're going to pick up something from her garage. My youngest jumped out of the car, ran right into the house before we can say anything. And he ran in to go get his grandmother a hug. So you know, I know that's just an example of a lot of the things that everybody's kind of going through um, with just our elders. And mind you, I choose to use the word elder out of respect instead of senior citizens and all that kind of stuff. But our elders are a little bit um, off on their own right now. And it's important, as the doctor was saying, Dr. Sanders was saying, we need to make sure that if there's technology, we need to be that bridge to technology. We need to make sure that we are available, that we're doing the six feet and that we don't just go into our own little world at our houses and we're operating that way. And then we can kind of bring the grandparent in every now and then. We have to make sure that they're taken care of. Um, in a week, next week, um, remember that this is the first in the series. So next week, we'll actually be talking about depression with another um, uh, African-American doctor that's in our community. And we'll be detailing depression and how the, the
the symptoms of that are overlooked and we'll dive into that. And my other co-chair, Gail Graves, will be taking care of that, um, that topic and facilitating that. Yeah, Dr. So, um, Sanders is rejoining us now. Wonderful. Thank you everyone for your patience. Let me unmute her. So with, with that being said about elders, I did want to dive into um, risk versus benefit. And I wanted to talk a little bit with you about what we're doing right now. Teachers are, parents are, um, employees, essential workers. Right now, what we're doing, same thing with athletics. We're saying, okay, this is the risk. This is the benefit. I need to figure out if the risk is worth the benefit. Right, right, right. Um, so there are a lot of risks with uh, reintegrating back into society, right? Yeah. Um, going back to school, going back into the workforce, going back to places of worship and other fun places that we used to go. And for teachers in particular, the risk is high. The risk is high because if you've got 25 to 30 students in your class and they are interacting with five to seven people at home, do the math. That increases your probability of possibly being exposed to this disorder, right? So um, essential workers, grocery store employees, right? Post office employees, they're interacting with the, the general public. And when you interact with the general public, your anxiety has increased, uh, you know, double, triple, quadruple the amount than just the normal population. So consequently, you you have to make a tough decision do i continue to stay employed do i continue to work and teach students or do i say hey i, I i'm going to go on short-term disability or i'm going to go on long-term disability you have to weigh the way the risk do you have enough money in savings um do you have current bills and expenses that need that full paycheck and that was the problem that was happening with so many um uh, Latin, uh, uh, Latin Americans who were Hispanics, who were working in a lot of uh, meatpacking processing facilities and um, in other clothes building type of jobs. And that those that virus was spreading, spreading pretty rapidly. And just recently, I was listening to the news, since school has started in many places throughout the country, 2000 teachers and students are now being quarantined right? They're quarantined because of the virus. And what that means is that someone was exposed and that put them at risk who then, and when you become at risk, it puts your loved ones at risk because you're interacting with your loved ones, right? And so it's a very difficult decision. Um, I applaud, you know, uh, leadership who are erring on the side of caution and saying, hey, until we have a safe way to bring all these individuals back. People who are with autoimmune disorders, who are compromised, um, teachers who typically sometimes are older and elderly, we should not be putting them at risk. E-learning, other methods of, of getting instruction. Sure, it might last a year. The best thing is for kids and students to be in school, but we gotta weigh the risk. And right, right. one year, or half a year is is a is is going to be a drop in the bucket of their overall learning, but individuals will remain alive, and we have to just weigh that, and 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 that's just what um, our leadership across the country are they're making that tough decision. Yeah. So when we're dealing with that, and we you we, you talked about the teachers and how they have to make this decision, and mind you, some don't honestly, some don't have a choice. They got to go back to work. They need the money, or they just love the kids so much. Um, how do they manage that anxiety? Like, what is your recommendation for those people? And the same thing for the parents, they're making these same kind of decisions. Anxiety is gonna be there as you've kind of explained, but what can they do about it when you're stuck in a situation where you feel like you really don't have a choice? So even if you risk benefit, it's like, uh, it's not really your choice. You have to go and do something. Right, so you have to remind yourself that you are taking the appropriate precautions you know, so so the way anxiety is, 
it's like a green stalk. You know, you think of a big green stalk that grows and grows and grows. It's fed, it's fed through sunlight, you know, nutrition, air, you know, just the general things we learned in science, right? Johnny's green stalk. It just grows and grows and grows. But we got to cut off the green stalk from growing. We don't want our anxiety to grow and grow and grow. We want to uh, uh, prevent it from getting the, the, the nutrients to feed it. And the nutrients to feed anxiety are negative statements, fears, you know, regurgitating what's on the news, um, thinking the worst, you know, that feeds our anxiety and we don't want to feed the anxiety. We do want to take precautions and we do want to be mindful, but we don't want to feed our anxiety. And how we feed it is like we challenge those thoughts. Oh, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. No, right? You're not, in many cases, you're not going to die. Um, many people have lost their lives, but for the general majority, they, the death rate has, is fairly low, right? I, I, I'm not for certain if it's five or 6%, but the vast majority of us will not die from COVID, but we may have some complications, right? So you got to tell yourself you're not going to die. You got to tell yourself that you're not going to spread it to your loved ones. You're going to tell yourself that, you know, we're going to take it one day at a time and evaluate the situation as it goes. If it looks like that things are getting worse and the leadership at your school or at your place of employment aren't respecting, you know, the CDC guidelines and recommendations, then what we want to do is, um, you know, consider what other options exist. But we got to cut off feeding the anxiety and not regurgitating the, the negative in our mind in order to protect ourselves. Excellent. Those that just joined us, um, my name is Demetrius Willis, I'm co-chair for the African American Community Partnership Group, and I'm here talking to licensed psychologist, Dr. Tiffany Sanders, and we're just diving into, we're just putting our feet into um, COVID-19 and the impact and the different decisions that we have to make that are really hard right now. Um, and I'm hearing uh, Dr. Sanders say, you know, sometimes you have to step away from the negativity and, and having support around you is really important. And the other thing is, it's okay to have negative thoughts, but those negative thoughts shouldn't stick around and not be challenged. You mm -hmm. should be able to challenge those thoughts and see how realistic they are. And in the big picture, can you kind of transition from those into maybe some positive? Absolutely. Challenge the thought, restructure the thought, reframe what you're thinking, right? So, uh, you know, again, this is a worst case scenario. I'm going to catch the virus and I'm going to die. Again, the numbers don't support that you're likely going to die. Um, now, again, if you are immune compromised, that is a very true statement that you're more prone or at risk for some serious health concerns. But for the general average public, it is going to be a, a, a very difficult virus that's going to, you know, wreak havoc on your body and, and for, the, for a couple of weeks. But at that point, you got to say no. Most people have recovered from it. D.L. Hughley recovered from it. He's the same age right. as I. You know, you got to say Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson recovered from it. You got to start challenging it with accurate statements, right? right. To 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 offset what what's circulating in your mind or percolating in your mind, like oh god, I'm going to die, or oh god, I'm going to lose my job. Okay, they have not issued layoffs at your job. You know, most people are employed. Um, you you even if you did lose your job, you have wonderful skills and attributes that will be valuable to the next employer, right? Mm -hmm. So structuring and reframing is so vital in order to overcome those anxious thoughts. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, as we talk, does this feel like, you know, grown folks talk? Does this seem like, because right now, a lot of parents, teachers, mm -hmm. the community are making decisions for kids, but not necessarily talking to kids about those decisions. Um, and as we talk about anxiety, right. we're anxious about it. And then I talked earlier about, you know, passing that anxiousness on just based off of how I'm reacting to things. Right. Right. So is this something that parents should be talking to their kids about um, this, not just anxiety itself, but also the situations that are giving them that anxiety? Yeah, you know, I think parents should not hide the seriousness of COVID. They should not hide the seriousness of the, their fears and worries and, and concerns. And the reason why they should not hide is that children eventually grow up. 
you know, children, not eventually, children will grow up. We're going to speak very positively. Children will grow up. And, and when they grow up, we want to have taught them the best coping skills to manage stressors. And this is a real life continuing stressor day it's a daily stressor that's been lasting for months we don't know what it, when it's going to end so if we paint this rosy picture or if we hide children from the stressors then they're not going to learn what they need to learn in order to cope when they have a possible pandemic in their life right, right. it may not be a pandemic but it might be another 9 11 god forbid right so if we don't see healthy coping skills skills modeled by our parents, have talked about, then when do we acquire those skills, right? So we should talk about, man, this stuff suck, you know, excuse my language. This is really yeah. stressful. But how am I going to handle the stress? You know what? Uh, we're going to go for a walk. We're going to go to the park. We're going to go, you know, order uh, out and, and, and or have movies um, in our own backyard and have our own theater, right? We're going to do whatever we can to alter our life in a way that feels like we're back to some level of normalcy as a strategy to teaching others. That is a coping skill, right? The more mm -hmm. we keep coping skills, the better our children will learn how to deal with this when it's their turn, right? I have a two-year-old. Of course, I'm not, I can talk about this all day long. She doesn't get it. But you have a 13-year-old and a nine-year-old. Absolutely, you should be telling them, you know, dad's concerned. Dad hasn't seen mom in a while. You know, or dad, how does that make you feel? Makes me feel pretty angry. Who are you angry at? I'm angry at the fact that, you know, this circumstance just exists. Not, I'm angry at China. I'm angry at the fact that the circumstance exists, right? right. I'm, I'm angry at the fact that we have to uh, wait to figure out how to tackle this virus. I'm, I'm angry at the fact that grandma hasn't been able to go out and do the things that she needs. But I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative that you know, I'm still employed, that you guys are healthy and well, and grandma, even though she cannot see us as much, that we are doing FaceTime with her, social media, Instagram Live, right? You can acknowledge the, the worst, but still um, explain it in terms of healthy ways as to how to manage it, right? Acknowledge right. and manage, acknowledge and manage. Don't hide and be like, man, I don't know what's going on. Where? What pandemic? No, we ain't got no pandemic. Why? Why lie? Tell the truth. Shame right. the devil. Right, and that's what we say. So that's what we say. <laughs> don't hide it from the children. You don't so, gotta be raw, but just don't hide it. Yeah, I love the transparency that you're talking about, and because we're being transparent, then the kids are taking some of that on. What are some symptoms that parents and teachers, because as schools open, teachers need to actually watch for this as well. Yeah, parents watch at home. Like what? what anxiety look like for some of these kids? How can, it, how can we all as a community be more aware of what's going on with our youth? You know, that goes all the way up to those graduating high school students. Anxiety may vary based on your age and, and just, um, when I say it varies, your presentation of the anxiety may vary, okay. right? Um, you, one person might feel like they have a racing heart, perspiring, um, they can't sleep. The other person is gaining weight, you know, irritable, agitated, right? We're looking at a, a continuum of, of uh, symptoms, right? We don't want to say, well, I didn't see all of this. No, because in a child, they may not demonstrate those same, those same symptoms that you may demonstrate as an adult. But we want to just be generally aware of that, you know, headaches, sweaty hands, you know, um, irritability, cannot sleep. Um, just a sense of fear and dread, agitation, um, irritation. Like we want to look at it all and say, okay, is my kids great? Are, are my son's grades declining? Are we seeing, you know, difficulty in, you know, at school or with his peers? Or are we watching more conflicts? Those are all indicators or signs that you know, anxiety is, is, is overwhelming your child. Um, and again, children may not demonstrate anxiety and or depression the same exact way, right? But yeah. when you start to see that irritability, agitation, um, that nervousness, 
you know, that, that children may be afraid to leave you alone, right? They want to stay close to you or always nearby you. Um, mommy, where are you going? Mommy, you know, I heard you cough. Are you okay? No, I'm okay. I'm okay. Seasonal allergies right. exist right? Listen for that. And don't be like, man, you acting like a little punk. You know, don't do that. You know, right. we're, we're so quick to like, at times, like hit below the belt to, to, to say, man, don't do that. Don't do all those things. We ought to, again, acknowledge that that anxiety exists right. and then help our children find healthy ways to manage it. Right. And it sounds like it's, it's like you're saying, acknowledging their feelings all of us feel a certain way. We just learn to kind of keep it in when in reality, we probably learned the wrong way. So exactly. we want to go know, ahead and restart with them. Well, let's be honest, you yeah. know, not speaking ill of the black church, but you know, we're, we, we've been taught like, you know, take it to the Lord in prayer. Okay. Well, if I'm taking to the Lord in prayer, I'm praying and that is a form of, of coping, but that means I'm always keeping it also internal, right? And, and who am I talking about, talking to it? Well, I talked to my mom and, and your mom may have the best of intention, but your mom learned the same strategies that weren't effective that we're, we're talking about, right? Yeah. And many of our parents are very old school. You don't air your dirty laundry. You don't tell other people that you're dealing with this stuff. And we need to normalize communication about mental illness. We need to know that African-Americans are disproportionately affected by COVID, disproportionately affected by the, un the high unemployment rate, disproportionately affected by uh, food deserts and, and health disparities. So we will have more anxiety. We will have more trauma. We will have more issues. And when people tell you, oh, how are you doing, girl? Blessed and highly favored. Child, please. We all got issues. You know, I'm mm -hmm. concerned. If you don't want to talk about it right now, my door is open. Come yeah. talk when you feel like you're ready. But do know it's okay to talk. Yeah, that's a great point. One of my favorite questions to ask my kids is, how do you feel about that? They'll say something that happened. How you feel about that? You know, let them be heard first and then I'll kind of weigh in afterwards, but mm -hmm. um, really good stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, the literature that you've been able to research and I know that you've written, mm -hmm. um, is there anything that shows certain people are at higher risk for anxiety than others? Yeah, there, there are going to be others who are higher risk um, if there's a family history of mental illness. Um, and it doesn't have to be your mom had anxiety. Your mom could have had schizophrenia. Grandparents could have had a depression. Individuals could have had alcoholism. You know, you, you may be more prone to dealing with depression and or anxiety, right? So if you, if you said no one was diagnosed, no one took medication, but did we have any individuals in our family that were addicts, right? That had, a, you know, very poor coping skills, um, that might be an indication that you might be at risk for dealing with mental illness, right? It runs in families. Um, again, if you're an essential worker, you're coming across the general public more than anyone. Um, so then your anxiety is going to likely be higher. Um, uh, black males are going to have at times higher anxiety related to certain things that, are, that generally impact them in a, in a more deleterious manner. Interactions with police, right? You're going to have anxiety. So we can pull out all these different subgroups and find that people of color are more prone to anxiety. Um, going to the doctor, oh gosh, you're going to feel anxious, right? Especially if you very rarely go to the doctor, right? And then you start to feel a little tickle in your throat. Oh man, I got COVID. I got Rona, right? You're going to be like, okay, I got it. That's going to peak your anxiety. We got to be honest that um, anxiety impacts our community. Yeah. Depression impacts our community. Trauma, PTSD impacts our community. And if we are honest about it, um, and again, you don't got to tell people your business. You're going to shout it from the rooftop, man, I'm anxious. No, you're going to do that. But when people talk about it, it's okay to embrace that conversation, not run and hide from it, because it's generally providing you with information and knowledge so you can improve your general welfare and your loved ones. Right. So we've talked about great ways of handling um, anxiety, really looking for the signs of anxiety. Um, mm -hmm. 
to talk about the other side. What are some unhealthy ways that maybe you've seen that like that is not how you deal with it? Now, we talked a little bit about denial. We talked about you better suck that up, you know, all those kind of things. Are there any things you would add to that that maybe some people are doing right now and they think they're managing it, but really you're just putting it on the back burner until it piles up and falls on top of you? You know, I, one thing in general um, I've noticed is that people, uh, you, you know, there was the shelter in place right when the pandemic occurred that forced all of us to be in our homes. But once that shelter in place had been, it was lifted, excuse me, in like June or, or what have you, um, individuals were more likely to stay in the house. They did not venture out. They have not gone out. They, you know, if they go out, they may may make the quickest run and they may go late at night when they think less people are there, right? And, and that in itself, um, isolating yourself, staying in the house more, uh, you don't have to necessarily go to large places, but you can go for a walk. You can go to the park. You can go to the lakefront. You can go to, uh, you know, a, a national forest. You can, and again, I like parks and recreation, so that's why I'm giving that mm -hmm. a lot of example, right? Um, you can go on trips uh, if you take precautions, but that's one concern I have of people, that people are still not getting out. They're, they're not, um, you know, visiting their loved ones um, and, and checking in with individuals. Some individuals, you know, are, are so anxious. They are using... Um, uh, you know, things as, such as, as illicit drugs, even though marijuana is legal in Illinois, they may do a whole lot of puff, puff and giving, you know, like that's, that's not what you want to be doing. You don't want to be, you know, uh, self-medicating your problems away, drinking excessively, um, sleeping, you know, your worries away. I'm going to just go to sleep, you know, Eating a lot of so food. that's not dealing with the issue. That's just pushing dealing, the issue off. You're you're not dealing with it at all, right? And and what we want people to do is to find, you know, counselors, psychologists, social workers, individuals who can sit down and talk with you, and help you make a, a good plan of action to to cope with COVID, cope with Rona, cope with the stressors, cope with you know insecurities about your job you have to let people know that you you have these needs and and there are so many resources that are available we need to just make certain you have access to them absolutely thank you for that you're welcome um so we are going to be wrapping up pretty soon if you have any questions regardless if it's work related you know um this is a licensed psychologist you have a shot at the at um, really talking to a professional about some concerns you may have, especially if they're related to COVID-19 and, and the other things going on in our community, social injustice, all these kind of things are hot topics right now that people are kind of dancing around at times and not really asking or dealing with the issue itself. So you're more than welcome to type something in the chat and then um, we'll get those questions answered. So we talked about the unhealthy ways. We talked about healthy ways of dealing with anxiety. Um, we talked about our elders and how to take care of them a little bit better than we are. And of course, um, having honest conversations with the kids in our lives, with the youth. And so they understand not only what's going on, but in the future, hopefully there won't be, but there may be worse things than COVID-19. So if you are able to handle this, then whatever else mm -hmm. comes your way will be no problem. But we have to teach him how to manage Mm -hmm. um, those feelings and acknowledging those feelings. So all those were great things that we talked about today from Dr. Uh, Sanders. Um, so if somebody is having anxiety and they're having it and it's flaring up, the, regardless of the reason why, what would you recommend today? Today is their opportunity to get the knowledge we're talking about, but also to start changing something. What would be maybe a couple of things you would recommend? Well, and thank you so much for asking that. So today, you might be in the midst of a panic attack. You might be in the midst of uh, an anxiety attack. When that attack subsides, and, and let me say for the record, it can last hours or it can just be a few minutes, right? So when that anxiety subsides, don't think like, oh, okay, I made it through. When you come out of it, then that's when I want you to, you know, find out what's your insurance, right? 
uncall your insurance company today.com uh, and type in your zip code. Look for mental health professionals who live or, uh, or are near where you work. Schedule an appointment and keep the appointment. Too many people reach out uh, when they're at the height of their their frustration, and then when it subsides, oh, okay, I, I don't I don't need counseling. Oh, I don't need to see the dietitian. I don't need no. Continue, keep the appointment. Um, and when you go to the appointment, tell people what you're feeling. Sometimes too often we'd be like, oh, how you doing? Oh, I'm good. No, something brought you in, right? Let's talk about what brought you in, right? Be transparent <laughs> and be honest. Um, after that anxiety moment stops, you know, get some fresh air, right? Get some fresh air, step outside, call a loved one. Um, you know, if you like to listen to music, listen to music, yoga, exercise. What we don't want to do is just grin and bear it, right? Um, we do want to break up those anxious thoughts. You know, I have to tell myself because I'll have those moments. I'm like, tip, tip, tip. Now, tip is my nickname, T-I-P. So I, I have to tell myself, tip, 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 stop it, girl, stop it. I have to sometimes shake my own self, right? So I can get out of that trance and that negative state, right? You do that, and that will then um, help you stop thinking that negative thought. So thought stopping is helpful, right? Um, changing your activities, putting your mind on something else. Well, it keeps coming back. I can't sleep. Okay. Well, we also may need to, while you make that psychologist appointment, make an appointment to see the psychiatrist, right? It is nothing wrong with having some sort of assistance in order to cope, right? Uh, when I had my daughter, I had a lot of stress. I didn't have postpartum, but I started to feel a little worked up because I had a lot of stuff going on. And so I saw the psychiatrist and I said, hey, I'm a psychologist myself. I can't tell somebody else to see a psychiatrist and don't go. I sat down in someone else's office and every three months for like almost nine months, so three sessions I, I had with him, it was helpful. He gave me a prescription. I took it and I was like, whoo, I feel a little bit better. Okay. You know, I didn't have no qualms about it. I didn't think it was going to change my, you know, people say, oh, I don't, want to, I don't want to change who I am. I don't want to become a zombie. There are so many opportunities or different medications that exist. You don't have these negative reactions to it. So the most important thing to do after that anxiety stops is to act. Act. Call. Reach out. Do not go into just a grin and bear it and then you just kind of like, you know, I'm going to sleep it off. That is what you don't want to do. You want to be proactive and act. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I think I may have heard in one of your videos, because of course I did a little research before we met, but like people deserve to feel better. And you Absolutely. felt like I deserve to feel better. And this is why I'm going to do it. You have to feel like you're worthy of that. Absolutely. And you have to feel that you deserve to have a good clinician treating you. If you feel like someone isn't, um, you know, uh, understanding what your concerns are, then absolutely you need to, uh, you know, change providers, go see someone else. There are enough providers in and around our community in the Chicagoland area and, and other large cities that we can access quali qualified mental health professionals who are either black or of color. Um, or, or, and it can still be majority individuals, but you can access them. Um, I got a question where someone says, do you recommend any exercises for people to do on their own as part of their self-care routine? Again, positive affirmations, you know, wake up, you know, I want to have a good day. I won't let little things bother me. Take a lot of deep diaphragmic breaths because when you're anxious, you do less breathing. And then that, that, that rouses your, your circulatory system and you get more anxious and irritated and agitated. So we wanna get air to your nervous system. We wanna get air to your brain so then you can start to, to calm down and to relax. So again, deep breathing, positive affirmations, um, reaching out to your loved ones. I, I'm always usually on the fence about journaling, and let me tell you why. Because sometimes you could get to writing, and you get to write a lot of negative stuff, you know, and you're regurgitating all the bad, right? So I'm never the one 
to say if you're gonna I'm gonna be I'm gonna say if you're gonna write write positive affirmations. Don't just say this is what happened to me. That S O B that M F R. No, don't be don't just list your grievances. Right? Say had a rough day, but I'm determined to make today's about today a better day. I'm you know here was my success. I went outside. I went outdoors. I saw my loved ones. Like if you're gonna write, write positively. Excellent. So um, if somebody's interested in following you or are you on social media like that, you know, if they want to kind of keep track of some of the tidbits and knowledge that you drop every once in a while, or if they have an organization, they want a speaker, like how would they get in contact with you? How would they follow you? Yeah, you know what? I, I want people to reach out to me. I, I want to be a resource or tool. So you can um, go to my website, drtiffanysanders.com, D-R-T-I-F-F-A-N-Y-S-A-N-D-E-R-S.com. I can type it in the chat as well, just to make certain that people, oh, Janelle put it in there. Thank you, Janelle, so much. You are on it, girl. Um, people can um, go to my Instagram page. I post a lot of pictures of my family, but I'm also an activist at heart, you know, and I'm going to remind you of things that you need to be paying attention to that may be mental health related or politics related. Because to me, if you don't exert control in your political life, then the powers that be will exert that control over you, which will then have a later impact on your general welfare and, and well-being. So I used to be on a radio, hosted, uh, you know, my own radio show and was fill in a host for several uh, of the personalities. And I tried my best to warn people about this upcoming administration because of the fact the warning signs were there. We knew in the psychology community, in the psychiatric community, we knew who was going into that office and we wanted to stop it as quick as we can. And you have to be active so that you can make positive change because they, it does trickle down and affect your well-being and your family's well-being, right? Mm -hmm. um, people can find me on uh, Instagram, Dr. Tiffany Sanders, uh, Twitter, uh, Dr. Tiffany S, Facebook, but most importantly, call my office. That number is 708-223-8405. That's 708-223-8405. My office manager and I will, will help you, we'll get you the resource, and if we're not a good resource for you, we'll recommend someone else for you. Excellent. So I'm sure everybody has their favorite tidbits. Um, and so wait, we have a question. Someone asked, uh -huh. um, I was prescribed Xanax. How long should I take it? So Xanax is a rescue anxiety pill. So if you're going into a stressful circumstance, you may take a Xanax in order to relax and to calm down so you can perform in that moment. But Xanax isn't something that you should be taking on a daily basis unless your anxieties are that high, then I would say talk with your psychiatrist about another anti-anxiety med or antidepressant that you can take on a daily basis. But Xanax is something that's more of a rescue drug that you will take in the moment before, again, some action performance, something that you have to do, take a test, you know, do a speaking engagement, then it will help you bring those levels down so you can do a better job and just focus on the moment. Excellent. So um, two little tidbits that I'm taking with me from our conversation today. I'm sure everybody kind of wrote down some things that really struck them. For me, it was challenge your negative thoughts and remember that you deserve to feel better. So um, just take those things with you. And remember the African-American Community Partnership Group, we are located in Lake County, Illinois. We have weekly meetings. We are active in the community and we are trying to institute change. We practice education and awareness so you get the knowledge and self-care. This today was the first in our self-care series. Our next self-care will be on August 17th. That one's at six o'clock as well. And um, we'll be talking to another uh, psychologist about some other issues that affect the black community. So please tune back in, go to our Facebook page, follow us, you'll get a lot of information there. And once again, thank you, Dr. Tiffany Sanders so much. This has been fun and informational you know so you can't beat we talked about balance and that's the balance so that's the balance. Um, well, it was thank great. you so much awesome talking to you thank you so much 
to Alicia Fielder for asking me to, to join. I love you, my wonderful soror, so I'll do anything for you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Demetrius. Thank you, Janelle. You guys were fantastic. Again, anyone who want to reach out to me, 708-223-8405 um, or visit my website at drtiffanysanders.com. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, and Bye. we'll see you on the 17th. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we'll connect with you, Dr. Sanders, offline, because, of course, we want to do over. <laughs> so oh, yeah. Technology wouldn't let us be great. So at, at your leisure, we know your schedule is busy, and, of course, we respect that and appreciate your time. So we will connect with you offline. Thank you, Demetrius. You did a great job. I oh. recorded it, so I'll try and edit it and splice it together so we can at least post it to our Facebook page at a later date. Yeah, please. Absolutely. Because I'd love to uh, put some of those, um, you know, a couple minute clips of a, a good segment on Instagram so that, you know, maybe 